Hi, everyone. Welcome to lecture three. Uh, we're going to cover statistical power or sample size calculation in this uh, in the first module, and then do two commonly used randomization methods, uh, which is blocking and clustering. And then on the analysis side, we'll cover differences in differences estimator. So this is an outline of this week's lecture. So the first unit uh, to prepare us for statistical power and sample size calculation, we're going to first review some basic concepts, which is type 1, type 2 errors, and the power of a test. When I had my first statistics class, I actually had a hard time to differentiate between type 1 type 2 errors. But then I ran across this analogy, which I thought was really good. And so we're going to bring this into our lecture. So remember the story about the boy who cried wolf. When we were kids, our parents used this to teach us not to lie. So let me quickly review the story. So the boy was a shepherd. When he was herding sheep, he got bored. So he decided to create some excitement. So he cried, wolf. He said, oh, a wolf is here. Then the farmers nearby heard the cry, and they came. Then they realized there was actually no wolf. So they left. And some days later, the wolf actually came. So the boy cried again, the wolf is here. Then the villagers at this point thought, wow, the boy must be having some fun, and it's just a joke, so we're not going to rescue him. And this time, it's real. So, so this, you know, first time and second time, can, we can draw the same analogy for type 1 error and type 2 error. So let's frame the story in the null and alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis here is that there is no wolf, whereas the alternative hypothesis is that there is a wolf, so what's a type 1 error? The type 1 error is when the first time the villagers came, they believed the boy when there was no wolf. So basically, they reject the null hypothesis incorrectly. So how about the second time? The second time, the villagers did not believe the boy when there actually was a wolf. So this time, they rejected the alternative hypothesis incorrectly. What does this have to do with experiment design? Um, now we're going to replace wolf with treatment effect. Okay, So the null is that there is no treatment effect. And the alternative hypothesis uh, is that there is a treatment effect. So what's a type 1 error then? The type 1 error in this context is that there is the truth. The underlying truth is that there is no treatment effect. But the researcher or the experimenter believe that there actually is a treatment effect. How about a type 2 error? So a type 2 error in this context is when there is actually a treatment effect. But through your design of the experiment, you cannot detect it, which means that you reject the alternative hypothesis incorrectly. Okay. So now we're ready, after we review type 1, type 2 error, we're ready to go on to power analysis and sample size calculation. Why is this important? Before you run an experiment, when you design an experiment, one thing that every experimenter or analyst encounters is how large should the sample size be? How many subjects or how many users should I recruit? And so most of the analysis here comes from a paper by Liz Sadoff and Wagner. So we're going to use their notation, which is also commonly used notation in this context. So we'll first give an overview of the um, sample size and power calculation, and then we'll go through some of the slides. So the overarching idea uh, when you design an experiment is to maximize the variance of the treatment variable. And you have to adjust the samples to account for variance heterogeneity, which means that you know, your treatment might have a different variance compared to the control condition. And the rough rule of thumb is that you want to put most of your sample, most of your observations, your users, 
into the experimental condition with a larger variance. We're going to make it more rigorous. So the first thing that we're going to do is to have an overview. So there are several factors that affect the sample size calculation. One is the size of your population. The other one is the resources you have. What's your budget? Or look at a situation where the marginal cost uh, from the treatment condition and the controlled condition will be different, and you have a budget constraint. So that affects your sample size as well. How many research assistants uh, you have, so that's the manpower. What's your method of sampling? We'll talk about, we talked about complete random assignment and simple random assignment. And today we're going to talk about, you know, stratification or blocking as well as clustering. Also, the degree of difference to be detected, that's something that you want to decide ahead of time. So let's take the example of an education experiment. So for instance, you want to test the hypothesis that a larger, uh, let's say, a larger number of students would make the learning experience less effective. So your outcome variable is test scores. And so compared to the control condition, you have, a, a, let's say, one treatment. Uh, what is the difference in test scores that you want to detect in, through the design of the experiment? The other important factor is variability, so which is captured by standard deviation. Where do you get that data? So that basically tells you how noisy your data will be. That usually comes from either a pilot study or historical data. That's you know naturally occurring data. That's non-experimental data. The next set of factors is the degree of accuracy uh, in your inference process. So here, we're back again, type 1 error. Or sometimes we often use the Greek letter alpha to denote type 1 error. And typically, the convention is that type 1 error should be less than 5%. That's the cutoff for claiming statistical significance. It is somewhat arbitrary, but that's the convention that many disciplines use at this point. The other factor is type 2 error, and sometimes we call it beta. So type 2 error is typically uh, set to be less than 20%. And so the power of the test is 1 minus beta. So if you have type 2 error of, let's say, 20%, that means if the treatment effect is actually there, that means if the wolf is actually there, uh, remember the, the boy who cried wolf, there's an 80% probability that you will actually see it. Okay, so that's the power of the test. So now we're going to put this in a two by two table. So on the horizontal axis, you have the true situation, which is the population situation. So there are two alternatives. One is that there is actually a difference, H1. That's the alternative hypothesis. The other one, the other situation is that there's no difference, so H0. That's the null hypothesis. On the vertical axis, you have the conclusion you draw from the experiment. So again, you either draw the conclusion from your experimental data that the difference exists, or there's no difference. So there are several scenarios. One scenario is, you know, there truly is no difference between the treatment and the control condition. And through the design of your experiment, you also correctly infer that there is no difference. And that happens with probability 1 minus alpha. And if you set your alpha equals 5%, you will be able to reach the correct conclusion with 95% probability. The second situation is, you know, in the population, the true situation is that there is no difference between the treatment and the control condition. However, you conclude from your experiment that it actually exists. So there is a difference between the, the treatment and the control condition. So that happens with probability alpha. So going back to our convention, if you set alpha equals 5%, so that happens with probability 5%. And the next scenario is, in the population, the difference actually exists, so which means that the treatment has an effect, but you infer that there's no difference. 
probably sometimes because your sample size is too small, so you're not powered enough to detect the difference. And we say that in that case, you made a type 2 error, and that is that happens with probability beta. So you can set your beta equal you know, 20% or 10%. Lots of times, people would like to push it towards a lower percentage. So what about when there's uh, actual difference? And you also say you can infer from your experimental data that the difference exists. So that's the correct inference. And that happens with probability 1 minus beta. So when you set your beta equals 20%, you can expect to infer the treatment effect when it actually exists with probability 80%. So this is the overview of the type of errors in hypothesis testing when you design an experiment. So now we're going back to our experiment design. And what is the power of the design? That's the probability that for a given effect size and a given statistical significance level, alpha, we'll be able to reject the hypotheses of zero effect when the treatment effect actually exists. So in other words, the power of your experiment design is the probability of detecting a real effect. So now you see that it is really important. So if your treatment actually could produce an effect, so there is a real effect, but your design is underpowered, you then waste resources. You design and run an experiment, but you don't see the effect. So how do you decide the size of the sample? How do you decide how many users you would use or how many subjects you need to recruit for your experiment? So these are the steps, and then we're going to proceed to you know, the way that you actually calculate the sample size. So first, you need to determine the expected difference or the minimum average treatment effect. And so that's sometimes in real terms in, let's say, the test scores. Or sometimes it's actually measured in standard deviations. The second step is to find out the standard deviations of both groups. And so now we're talking about the simplest experiment where there's only one control condition and one treatment condition. So where would you find that out? It's not always easy. Lots of times we have some empirical data. Uh, you have you know, the prior year's test of, of test score from students of various class size. The data is not perfect, but that gives you an idea of how noisy the data is. So that enables you to, to, to figure out the standard deviations. Another way to do this is to run a pilot experiment, which, which is you, know, you, you try out your experimental conditions on a smaller sample to test your program and also to get the standard deviations. And the last one is, in, in fact, to get it from theory. And we're going to use an example at the end to show how you might expect to get you know, the standard deviations of your treatment group from theory. Sometimes the theory will give you a direction, whether the standard deviation will shrink or it's going to enlarge in the treatment group. So the third one is, you know, before you start your experiment, you set the alpha error or type 1 error to be tolerated. And the convention is to set it at 5%. Of course, you can also move it to, you know, 2%, 1%. The smaller the, the type 1 error is, the larger your sample size ha will have to be, given the other parameters. And the next step is to de decide the uh, power of the study. And as I mentioned, we typically use 80%. And in some type of study, such as replication studies, you might want to have higher power, which is, for instance, 90% or 95%. That means that your type 2 error is going to be correspondingly, you know, 20% or 10% or 5%. Then you can select the appropriate formula to calculate the sample size. In most statistical softwares, you can actually just plug in these parameters and it will calculate for you. Then you can, you know, either the program, the statistical program, you know, will spit out the uh, sample size for you, or you can do it using some other methods, for instance, calculating by hand.
And the last part that we're going to cover in the next lecture is you need to allow for dropout rate. So sometimes people enroll in a program and then they drop out of the program. So you have to take that into consideration as well and perhaps to allow for non-compliance of treatment. Uh, again, that's um, material to be covered in week four.